All righty, all right. Let's turn to 497. Those that have been in choir practice tonight will think that I am doing this deliberately. 497 is written as the first song for tonight. Yes, and pastor has confirmed. You will know what I mean in a minute. Let's stand and sing. Jesus, I, my cross, have taken wish we could take the trials that come our way as our Savior took them as he faced the cross of Calvary. We ask, Father, that you'd help us to uh, be willing to bear what it is that you'd have us to bear for the testimony of Christ. And we ask that you'd help us to uh, take in the truths of your word that will be beneficial to us here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. All right, 303. If you have God, you will have joy and peace. If you try to chase joy and peace apart from God, you will fail. 303, verses 1 and 4. Bye. 
611, 611. We'll sing one in five. Take my life and let it. Take my heart, it is thine own. Your heart is the only thing you can give to God that he doesn't already own. Think about that. He's loaded. He's got everything. Except for one, right? And even that, we have but a limited amount of time when we do that voluntarily. Nothing else, I know I've said it before throughout history, has ever voluntarily served God. They didn't have any option. Right? Do you think the pigs voluntarily ran off the cliff? Nope. The animals didn't voluntarily go in the ark, just like the piggies didn't voluntarily go in the trailer. Right, Rachel? What? I said nothing. I said that the animals didn't voluntarily go in the ark any more than the piggy voluntarily went in the trailer. Yeah. Off you go, piggy. Okay. don't have any announcements this evening other than what we had this morning. I don't know what the status is on the VBS refreshment list, uh, but take a look. Um, sign up for Twinkies or something. Oh, Jim, would you mind taking our offering this evening, please? And lead us in prayer. All right, what do you have to share tonight? Scriptures, testimonies, hymns. Barbara? (laughs) 
Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, see, Schmack. Um, I lost my place. <laughs> Good morning, Phil. Okay. Um, in Mark, chapter 5, I think it is. No, chapter 4, verse 39. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And thank the Lord for his calm, because I don't have a calm. <laughs> Only what he gives me, and he's so wonderful. He keeps me going in times of pain. So the Lord, which is nice, he's always there, and he helps me through it. And I'm just so thankful for his love and his watch care. Um, I had to bring one down here. Could we sing, I think it was four something. Wait a minute. 442. 442. Jesus, save your pilot me. Do you have a particular verse? All right, we'll sing the first one. Jesus, save your pilot me over life's tempestuous sea. Dave to say that, and then as soon as it seems like something's not going good, I'm going to grab a wheel. Jake? I'm thankful for some rain. Yes, sir. Can we sing 876? 876? It's kind of... Is that another oxymoron? I'm thankful for the rain. Can we sing till the storm passes by? <laughs> nice going, Jake. Well done, sir. <clears throat> First verse. In the dark of the midnight have I oft hid my face while the storm howls upon me and there's no Lister wrote a bunch of good songs. Appreciate a lot of his. What was the one we had just we were singing this morning, hon? Um, um, Gail, I'll be with you in just a minute. I'm, my mind is stuck. I'll have to think a bit later. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Gail, what do you got, Dia? Brother in law went through his uh, heart surgery well. Good. He had dialysis the next day. Which is, you know, like very overtaxing. Yeah. And then um, I guess this following month he has to go for um, some uh, vein surgery in his legs because everything is just collapsing. Okay. So he's going to be going to Boston for that. Um, so, but I guess his, his diagnosis is his renal failure and he's only got 30% in one kidney. But... Um, he had a lot of clogged issues with the heart and stuff, so okay. I mean that's cleared out, and he did bleed a bit afterwards, but um, they got that in control, so enough so that he could do dialysis the next day. So, um, just keep him in prayer. His name's Carrie, and uh, but um, having to do a lot of 
extra with my sister just to keep her spirits going. Got it. No, so, um, yeah, it's it, God's there and He's working well, but um, you know He's still going through the battles. Right. Yeah. Just because God there doesn't mean it's easy. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that means you lean on Him more, right? That's right. Yeah. I don't really have a song. So. Okay. Uh, All right. Just wanted to tell everybody, and because I asked you guys to pray for him and let you know how it went. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'm going to pick a song for you. Um, 845. thankful for Rowena Amen. and the chance we get to take her back and forth to services. Um, I probably wouldn't have gotten to know her the way that we do now um, if we hadn't been able, had the opportunity to, to transport her back and forth. She's got a lot of wisdom and um, the thing that sticks out to me most is her attitude. Um, yeah. Just a uh, an upbeat and cheerful attitude, even though life hasn't always been kind to her. She's had hard times. Um, none of it has made her bitter right. or um, upset, and she's just a real blessing. Amen. Yeah. It's a little bit of a lesson in pride for me. Right, you think, okay, good. Well, the Lord chose me to try to be a blessing to someone, only to realize that wasn't what He had in mind. Yeah, you don't be a blessing to nobody. Okay, you might get one, <laughs> but <laughs> Amen. Anybody else? Cassie.
I'm thankful that we get to go to New York tonight. You excited? Yeah. Did you have a song? No. No? Okay. Anybody oh. else? What, what's that? You want to have something else to thank the Lord for? The children. Okay. Did you still say that when you had some? <laughs> Amen. Jim uh, had his hand up there, Ty. It's quite a challenge to teach Sunday school class. And as you said, the Lord can use us in spite of us. I'm thankful for the comments that have come, but I'm just a channel of his. Number 477. 477. Anyone else have scripture or testimony before we sing this? This will be our last song. I would urge you guys to remember to keep uh, Jim and his preparation, uh, and also pat your pastor in prayer. Um, it may come as a surprise to you, but they don't always feel like studying. Okay? It takes a lot of work. And then to come and stand in front of y'all and act happy about it. It's not an easy job, and they need our prayers every day. 477, let's stand and sing. How oh, I praise thee, precious Savior, that thy love laid hold of me. Thou hast saved and cleansed and filled me, that I might thy channel be. Channels only, blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power, flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. Empty that thou shouldest fill. Blessed Master, part with all thy wondrous power, flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. Witnessing thy power to save me, setting free from self and sin, thou who borders to possess me. Blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power blowing through us, use us every day and every hour. Jesus, fill now with thy spirit, hearts that full surrender know that the streams of living water from our Please be seated. Very good. I'm thankful for the song leading that Matt does. And uh, taking the choir as he is, it's... Uh, Sometimes not a. It sometimes is a challenge dealing with us. <laughs> so thankful for the work he puts into that. 
Uh, we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 tonight, and we'll pick it up in verse 34. I got to say, this would be one of the portions you could say, well, we'll just skip over this. This is a, this is a difficult portion to deal with. Uh, but, you know, it's all the Word of God, and it's important that we uh, have the whole counsel of God, but we do it with the right spirit and the right attitudes, right? Uh, because the Scriptures not only have the facts, but they have uh, the heart to it as well. And we've got to understand that all of Scripture coincides with the rest of Scripture, and you have to balance it all together to get a, a, an accurate understanding of, of uh, God's will on a matter. So we'll read the verses, and we'll ask the Lord to help us, uh, give us understanding, and then we'll get into the, some preaching on it. Verse, thir verse 34 says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. Our Father, we're thankful for the scriptures you give to us. They're all necessary. You don't do anything or say anything that's unnecessary. Uh, some things are harder to maybe understand, harder to convey the truth that's, that's present. So we ask your help in that. Give us the right spirit and the right understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, just uh, I wanted to spend some time uh, with some background, I guess, to lay a bit of a foundation on this, pat this particular portion of Scripture. Uh, one of the things I think that is important for us to recognize is that there is a worldly influence around us. And uh, society has all sorts of views and influence that go contrary to the Word of God. Uh, and when it comes to uh, the matter of, of leadership and positions of authority, sometimes uh, society has views that are contrary to what God wants. But the world does have an influence on us, and I think it's important for us to recognize that. Uh, the Bible does warn us of the influence of the world, and when it says the world, uh, it can be people. The Bible uses world to refer to people sometimes. And sometimes it's used to refer to uh, society as a system, a world system, and the, the, the influence of a God-rejecting society, secular society uh, that doesn't recognize God in their thinking, in their actions, and doesn't recognize the Word of God as authoritative in their lives, and uh, that is going about to uh, make policies and, and uh, direct people according to the thinking of this world and according to the prince of this world, quite frankly, and not according to the Word of God. And that's the, the influence of the world or society. Uh, and sometimes the world is used in that context. And that's uh, the context I'm using it in here tonight. Uh, God's Word is clear what kind of relationship we are to have with the world. That is, the society we live in, the, the God that does not recognize God or or give reverence to God, and have respect for the authority of the Word of God. Uh, one of those is John 3.16. I think I'd like to start there, because it tells us, For God so loved the world. There, uh, is talking about people. He doesn't love the world system and the, that that's operating in this world by the prince of this world, the prince and power of the air, uh, Satan, and his uh, opposition to God but he loves the people that are impressed by the enemy of their souls in this world. God so loved the world, people, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever 
believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever. That's anybody. 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Okay, there, is that talking about people? No, that's talking about the, the system that is operating in this world, society, that is a God-rejecting uh, society. And we're not to love that, that influence that is around us in society, that is forsaking God, that doesn't recognize the authority of God nor His Word. So love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Okay, those are physical things that we can see and hear in this physical world we live in. We're not to love those things. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So there are elements of, the, of worldly thinking that, and practicing that is contrary to God. And that's why God says we're not to love it. Uh, too many Christians, I think, are trying to live with a love for the world and a love for God. And they can't coexist together. Uh, loving the things that God uh, hates means there's a lack of real love for the Lord. Because if we really loved the Lord, we would uh, stay away from and, and not want to be in, involved with those things that displease Him, that He detests. So if we loving the things that God detests, there's something not right with our love for, for the Lord. The Lord says the love of the Father is not in Him. So it, uh, recently, somebody left a rat here at the church. Well, if I fell in love with that rat and brought it home and uh, showed it to Carly, which I did bring it home and showed it to Carly, and uh, I'll have to say she detested that rat. And she goes, oh, that's nasty. It's disgusting. She detested the rat. Get that thing out of here. <laughs> no, she didn't really say that, but... She, it was very clear she detested the rat. She didn't want to look at the rat. She didn't want to be around the rat. The rat had to go to the garage in the cage <laughs> out of sight. <coughs> well, if I loved that rat and I came to my wife and said, you know, I really love that rat. I really want that rat to stay in our home. Oh, no. I detest that rat. Well, that's too bad. I'm going to have the rat in, my, in our bedroom tonight. <laughs> And uh, immediately she would start thinking things like, if he really loved me, he wouldn't bring that rat into my bedroom. <laughs> would she be correct? Yes, she would. All right? Because I would be doing something I know she detested but didn't care. And uh, that is what the Lord is getting at when he says, love not the world. The system of this world uh, has its ways in thinking that is contrary to God. It is sinful. It is wicked. And we're not to love it, nor the things that are in the world. It says, if any man love the world, the love of the Father isn't in him. There's something wrong with our love for God if we can love the world. Then Romans 12, 2 says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. All right? Living according to the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God requires a renewing of our mind. Our mind has to change the way it thinks. Because why? We have a sin nature. And we were born into this world and into this society with that sin nature. And there was an affinity for society and for this world that we have in our sin nature hearts, and in the sin nature of our hearts. And so Christians are not to conform to unbiblical thinking and practices that society is promoting. It is to be, in other words, we are to be molded not by our society, but be molded by God, the Word of God. 
And it does make a huge difference who we select our mold to be. And we do have a choice of what we have for a mold. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, kids will play with Play-Doh, right? And uh, I remember as a kid playing with Play-Doh, and I've watched our, our kids play with Play-Doh, and now grandkids play with Play-Doh. And sometimes uh, you can get these little molds. It might be a mold of a, a puppy dog or something. It might be a plastic mold or it might be an aluminum mold or some kind of a mold, and you can see it's a puppy dog mold. And the kids take that Play-Doh and they press it into the mold and squeeze it in there nice like that. Then they take and flip that over and pop it off, pop the mold off, and lo and behold, a perfectly shaped puppy dog in Play-Doh. It took the form of the mold, didn't it? And uh, as people, we are pliable, we are moldable. And it's a matter of what we're going to be molded to. And if we are, are choosing to be molded to society, if that's our choice, we're going to be looking like our society. If we choose to be molded according to the Word of God, our lives are going to start to be changed, our thinking is going to be changed, and we're going to become more like Jesus Christ. We're going to be more like what God wants us to be, more like what God's Word says. Well, there are uh, many movements in the world you see them come, you see them go, you see them change in time. I think you see them get worse as time goes on, which is consistent with what the Bible teaches. Things waxing worse and worse. But God is going to bring it all into correction. One day He's going to correct it all. Uh, but just the same, there are many movements in the world. And for our purpose tonight, I want us to think about the women's liberation movement. And I did a little bit of research on it, not a lot. Uh, but I did some, and uh, I've learned that it really began to, to blossom and to grow in the late 1960s. All right, I'd have been just a young fellow at that time. And it it's, uh, began its influence then, but that influence grew, and it's still active in the world today and strong in the world today. It seeks to eliminate any male authority over women, Wikipedia, uh, if you go online, you can look it up in Wikipedia, and its statement on this and how it began is this. The women's liberation movement was a political alignment of women and feminist intellectualism. It emerged in the late 1960s and continued into the 1980s, primarily in the industrialized nations of the Western world. That's us which affected great change, political, intellectual, cultural, throughout the world. I went on to explain that the liberation movement, the women's liberation movement, is a branch of radical feminism based in contemporary philosophy. That is all just very uh, wordy way of saying it's the world. Right, contemporary uh, philosophy. The movement rejected the Hebrew or biblical patriarchal system where men held positions of authority um, over the women in the family, work, and religious institutions. Well, as this blossomed and grew, uh, churches needed to make a decision, didn't they? Whether they would embrace this movement in society or whether they would stick to the teachings of the Word of God, such as we have here in 1 Corinthians 14, 34 down through 40. And it is a decision to make, but the decision made will greatly affect the direction a church goes. And whether that church is going to continue to have uh, God's pleasing and the blessing of God upon it, the pleasure of God and the blessing of God upon it. Uh, many churches since the 1960s have conformed to the social pressures of the women's liberation movement. And as a result, world conformity has taken place in the Church of Christ today. Women, it's not uncommon to just go around even uh, nearby uh, to various churches and see women in pastoral positions in the churches. 
It all boils down to God's order and, and uh, who, ha- who he has assigned the responsibility of pastoral leadership in his church and the leadership in his, in his church. It is his church, it's not our church. And he's the head of it, and that gives him the right and the authority to say how he wants it to operate. Uh, I wanted to give a couple of quotes from people within this uh, women's liberation movement to get us to understand and appreciate the animosity that exists between that movement and, and God and the Word of God. I think sometimes uh, we look at these movements and, oh, that's a, that's a crazy thing, or that's, I know that's not biblical, but sometimes we don't appreciate the severity of the animosity that is behind that, that's in the world. And I think it's helpful to do that. Uh, so uh, the following are quotes from an internet newsletter titled, Religion and Politics, Fit for Polite Company. Is written by Katie Gadini and dated May 31, 2022, just a couple years ago. Uh, the article is an essay titled Evangelical Women Revisit Feminism and Faith. Okay, which kind of struck me as an article that might be interesting to read. Evangelical Women Revisit Feminism and Faith. And it provides some historical information regarding the emergence of Uh, the feminist movement and women's liberation movement within the professing church of Christ. I say professing church of Christ because not every church operates according to the word of God, but many profess to. And uh, so this has uh, emerged in in many churches professing to be the church of Christ. So I'm going to read some of this just to highlight the oppositional nature of of this movement. Uh, She writes... This, in the early 1970s, the radical feminist theologian, Mary Daly, made some startling pronouncements. So here we talk a a feminist theologian, all right? She's involved in religion. First, she called herself post-Christian and declared that all religions are infrastructures of the edifice of patriarchy. Then she called for the castration of sexist religion and demanded the death of God the Father. Now let that sink into you a minute. Let's talk about the depth of opposition to the things of God. This is a woman that is trying to infiltrate into churches and her position demanded the death of God the Father. That's blasphemy. Blatant blasphemy. Daily who held two doctorates in religious studies and theology, worked as a professor at Boston College. She had previously identified as a reformist Christian working within the Catholic tradition and had endeavored to make religion a more welcoming space for women. In fact, her earlier book, The Church and Second Sex, was a feminist critique of Christianity in which Daly exposed the anti-woman elements of the faith and promoted a feminist Christian theology. Katie Gadini goes on to say, other second-wave feminists in the U.S., such as Andrea Dworkin and Leah Fritz, also focused their critical lens on the inherent anti-feminist nature of Christianity. You know, this is distorted. This is twisted. Christianity is not against women. The Lord Jesus Christ loved men and women. And uh, he died for both. Uh, to say that he is against women is, uh, is to uh, speak contrary to what, God really, what the Scriptures tell us God is like. But uh, that's what she was uh, suggesting. In, she wrote this book, Thinking Like a Woman, in that Fritz wrote that Christian women in the West are unloved, unrespected, unnoticed by the Heavenly Father, condescended to by the Son, and this is a foul word beginning with F, by the Holy Ghost. That, I'm telling you, is blasphemy. It came to mind, Mark 
3, 28 and 29, the words of Jesus Christ. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. I don't know if, uh, I doubt very much Fritz has listened to our live stream, but she'd do well to take to heart those words of Jesus Christ. Because the things that she is saying puts her in dangerous territory with God. Well, I tell you what, uh, churches that pick up this movement that is being promoted by these women uh, the, uh, theologians that are trying to introduce it into the church, that's what we're introducing into our churches. It is a dangerous, dangerous thing. There is a lot of pride. There's a lot of animosity toward God that comes with that movement. And uh, uh, there are probably some good reasons God uh, set up the government in the church the way he did. Uh, otherwise, that would be the prevailing doctrine of the church today. So God calls on Christian women to decide who they align their thinking with. Uh, we can align it with our society and this movement in society that really is a relatively recent movement from the 1960s up through our present day. We can choose that and to be molded by that and have our thinking formed by that, be influenced by that, or we can just stick to what God says and just trust that this is His church. He knows what's good for it, and uh, He had a plan for it, and we just need to stick to God's plan. I think it's worth noting that this is a plan for us while we live in this world. We live in this world, all of us, because uh, with us in nature. And so an order has to be here. Uh, it had to be instituted to keep order in our churches and in our homes. And somebody had to set that order. And it can't be man, because we'd always be fighting and vying for position, and it would be an endless battle. That had to be settled, though, and God settled it. He said, this is the way it's got to operate. And as long as we do it the way God says, it operates well. And to the extent we don't, then it starts to fall apart. And we see families and society falling apart today in part because they refuse to recognize the authority that God has instituted for families, for churches, and for our society and government. So let's uh, look at verse 34. This was all kind of background. But I, wanted, I think it was important for us to understand uh, the movement in society and the influence of it and the opposition that we face as believers in Christ today and the fierceness of that battle. So verse 34 says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. All right. Uh, understand this is in the context of public worship. What we have had here is uh, uh, speaking in tongues in the public worship. And this is talking about uh, speaking as far as publicly in the church, getting up and preaching, getting up and teaching before the church congregation, that kind of a thing. Uh, we know that God loves uh, the ladies that he interacted with during his time here on the church, and I mean that in a holy way. John 11.5 says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. I tell you, the Lord Jesus, contrary to what these women suggest, loves uh, the women as well as the men. He loves all people. And uh, he said in John 15, 9, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. And he's talking about all those that were following him, men and women. And so the Lord, Lord loves all the believers. Just the same, he has prescribed a means for us to operate as a church body. And it says, uh, let the women... Uh, Keep silence in the church is not permitted for them to speak. Well, uh, we do have in God's Word, let me see if I can find it here somewhere. It's about the 
the aged women teaching the younger women. All right, I haven't got it right on the tip of my tongue. might be Titus, actually. Yeah, Titus 2, I think. Let's turn there. If you just took that by itself, you think, oh, they haven't got any place of teaching. Well, there, there is a, a place of teaching. Titus 2, 3 to 5. The ladies' ministry in a church is a valuable ministry. It's an important ministry. It's a ministry that is much needed. Titus 2, uh, 3, 3 says, The aged women likewise, that they may be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. <laughs> oh, they're supposed to be teachers of good things. So it's, it's, the, it's the public address of the church body that is in question that in 1 Corinthians there. Otherwise, you know, they have a place of teaching that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. That's very important to be able to pass some of these things on to the next generation, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, what is that? That's just being consistent with what God is saying in 1 Corinthians that He wants. That the Word of God be not blasphemed. And uh, so there is a, a place of teaching, I believe, in the church for the, the women to teach other women, the women to teach the children. A very necessary part. Uh, and I don't think it means that you can't stand up and give a testimony either of the goodness of God. That's different than preaching or teaching the congregation. That's uh, when a person gets up and preaches and teaches, uh, they're exercising authority in the church. And that is what the Lord is addressing here, uh, that they not exercise that authority in the church. There is also the, uh, in verse 35, they that will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. All right, so... Uh, that is simply recognizing the role of the husband being the head of the wife in the home. And that God has seen fit to speak through the husbands to their wives. The, the husbands should be leading their homes, should be the spiritual leaders in their homes. The wives ought to be learning some spiritual things from their husbands. Uh, and God has seen fit to use the preaching of the Word of God in the church services. And uh, He will... Uh, minister to the hearts of people through the preaching of the Word of God. And, but we need to submit to the means that God uses to preach. He might at that time uh, give some insight in, uh, to the pro those that were prophets at the time to, to preach the Word of God. And he would, directly, he would show them directly these things to share with the congregation. And the means of the wives learning uh, was through their husbands at home. And not to exclude the, the learning in the church, but there, was, there ought to be that, that willingness to learn from their husbands in the home. We do know that uh, we're not limited to the preaching or teaching of men to have the Lord teach us things from the Word of God. It's not precluding women from having personal devotions and, and getting things from their devotions from the Lord uh, because we know we have the Holy Spirit. Uh, 1 John 2.27 says, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is true, and is no lie, and even it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. So we're not confined to the teaching of men, but we have the Holy Spirit that can teach us. I think the, what the Lord is getting at here in 1 Corinthians 14 is that he has established um, a system of authority for the home and for the church. And it's important for the church to respect what God has instituted. Husbands to be the head of their wives. Wives in subjection to their husbands. The men to be the pre preachers and teachers in the church. The ladies be able to listen to that but also uh, take the responsibilities that God has given to them to teach the other women and to teach the children and so forth. Uh, 
and to be able to praise the Lord, stand up, give testimony, those kinds of things. But the anointing uh, that we have is of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost speak, can show uh, women things from the Scriptures as well as men. It's just you uh, are not in the position of, of preaching it and teaching it in the congregation uh, as the men were assigned to do. You know, this is uh, by God's design. Uh, and if any uh, man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. All right? That is acknowledging the authority of Scripture. And the, that God uses others to teach us things. If any man think himself to be a prophet, well, we, aren't not, we are not to think ourselves the proprietor of truth. In other words, that I'm the proprietor of truth, and you have to get all your truth through me. That's a, that's a Pope kind of approach to it. That's not biblical. And he says, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. He says in verse 6, 36, what? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? Are you the proprietor of truth? No, uh, we can learn things from others, can't we? We ought to have a teachable spirit. It, it is just being submissive to God. And we all need to be submissive to God. We ought to have a humble spirit and be able to be taught by others and from others. Uh, we ought to be able to accept the responsibilities that God gives to us as men and, and be able to lead our homes spiritually to love our wives. And uh, we also need to be able to accept the, the authority structure God has placed in the church and be content with that and take our place under that. And do the things that God wants us to do, men and women alike. But he says, if any thinks that the word came to them only, they're the proprietors of, of the truth. If it was spiritual, it says, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. It says, a spiritual minded man is going to recognize that these things are from God, that we're reading right here, that these are, these are the words of God to us. And. Uh, that was coming through Paul. Trying to encourage them to learn, uh, be able to learn from others and receive from others the Word of God. It says, but if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. So if he has determined that he's not going to listen, then he's just going to be without understanding. If you ignore the commands of God, you're going to be ignorant. <laughs> you're not going to be understanding of the things of God. And so with that determined ignoring, that's ignorant, ignore, ignoring uh, what God wants, we're not going to be, we're going to be ignorant. We're, not going to, we're going to lack understanding. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. He's just reiterating there that uh, prophecy is most profitable. It reveals the truths of God's Word to the people. Uh, that being the case, though, there was a place for tongues, and it wasn't to be prohibited. They, it should be allowed for the purpose that God brought it. In verse 40, says, Let all things be done decently and in order. All things be done decently and in order. There's nothing orderly about an ongoing power struggle in a church. Uh, that just leads to chaos. It leads to church splits. It leads to all sorts of things. I was uh, uh, watching the young people after church services, mostly uh, in the evening. They had these little clubs started, and they get together and have their little clubs out front, and they're uh, enjoying their time together, which is good to see. And, uh, but, you know, even then, in their little club, one of the first things they had to do was, who, who's going to be the leader, you know? We've got to have an election. We've got to have a leader here, right? It just has to be that way. There's got to be some leader to lead, and, uh, and it has to be recognized by the, the rest. And so in our case, in the church's case, Christ is the head of the church. He has assigned who that leadership is to be. It is to be the men in the church, and it is, uh, 
and the rest are to accept that and to operate within those bounds that, that God has set. He's just said this is the way it's going to be. It simplifies it for us, very much so. Because one of the things that I noticed happened not too long after this club started is somebody else wanted to be a leader, right? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, oh, they've got to have their club. And then you see the one club start to split up into smaller clubs. Well, that's what happens in churches, doesn't it? We call them church splits. It comes down to, a lot of things in a church comes down to accepting authority. And it really comes down to accepting God's authority what God says. Uh, I think it's important for us to understand that uh, God has a work for all of us. It, doesn't, it does matter in this life to, to respect God's ways and to do it God's way. Uh, it benefits us now, but it also benefits us eternally when we do it God's way. I, there is nothing in this that even insinuates that uh, women are inferior to men or men are superior to women. That's not the message of Scripture. It is simply a matter of roles assigned by God. And all the roles, the roles that the women play are equally important as the roles that the men play. And this works well as long as everyone accepts their role and fulfills their role as God designed it. It works wonderfully that way. Uh, we all get into trouble if we start trying to take a role upon ourselves that is not given to us by God, and then we start running into all sorts of difficulties and troubles and problems. But uh, this is given uh, just so the church was clear as to what its head wants, how it wants it to operate, how it wants it to operate, and that's all that is. It's just a... a a structure that is designed by God for his church. And uh, by the grace of God, we can just accept that and appreciate the Lord loves us all. We're all valuable to God. We have a place that's important in service for God. And uh, we all desire to get the rewards of well done, good and faithful servant when we do see him. Our Father, thank you for our time together this evening. We ask thy Blessing upon you, word. We're thankful that you love us, each one. We are children of God, men and women. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all partakers of the inheritance in the saints uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we're all kings and priests to thee. Uh, Lord, we are all in a marvelous position. You see us equally in that regard as part of your family, loving us each one. But as we are living in this world and are uh, operating as your church locally here, you have assigned a certain structure to it. Uh, pray, Father, we'll operate according to your structure that we can be recipients of your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Those kind of messages, i got to say, are tough because <laughs> it's just, everybody understands that, I think. It's... Two hundred ninety-eight is us closing him. Two ninety-eight. I think this is what it really all boils down to. It's not I, but Christ, right? Let's really, let's simplify it here as we sing this hymn. When it comes to the church or our families or whatever it is, it isn't about me, it's about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he wants. So let's stand as we sing. Um, let's sing one in five. But Christ be honored, loved, exalted, not I, but Christ be seen, be known, be heard, not I, but Christ.
be saved from myself, dear Lord. Oh, to be lost in Thee. Oh, that it might be no more I, but Christ that lives in me. Our Father, we're thankful that you have given a structure for us to follow. It makes it clear. It makes it simple. Uh, there are those that have responsibilities of authority. And there are those that have the responsibility of following uh, that authority. We ask that each of us would fulfill the, the roles that you've given to us in this life, knowing that when we get to glory, we're all on an equal plane and that uh, we all are, have the inheritance that is ours in Christ. Thank you for making some of these things clear for us so we can understand them in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.